What, what about Israel? What would your approach be to, to dealing with uh, the Israeli government, whether or not Netanyahu is in power? How, what would your approach be to Israel? Now, is, Israel is a different situation, and Netanyahu is a far right, really very bad for Israel. Now, with respect to the solution, uh, the leadership of Israel has not been all that keen on arriving at really a peaceful solution. That is a two-state solution. They feel that the only answer is for them to make life so difficult uh, for the Palestinians that they'll leave, and they force them to leave. And so then you you know you still got Gaza and you still got what's left of the West Bank and what when I say what's left with all of the settlements there's not going to be much left to really effect a solution in that regard we have to stop the military strength uh, to perpetuate the violence that exists and there's violence on both sides but I think right now there's a little more violence. Uh, perpetrated by Israel. It's stones against uh, nuclear power. How do you then change the relationship with Israel? Would you continue to give any military aid to Israel? No, no, not at all. They don't They don't need any military. They export military capability abroad. So, so if they can export it, they have more than enough to take care of, of their security. No, Israel is militarily safe. It's economically dependent upon us. And I buy into, if you feel deeply about this and you want to boycott uh, some of uh, the industries of Israel, fine. It's a free country. You should be able to boycott. We must continue to stand firm against the profoundly biased campaign to delegitimize the state of Israel through boycotts, divestment, and sanctions. And I, and I think it's appalling that uh, the Jewish interests in the Congress are, are denying us our civil rights and our ability uh, to boycott. Senator Mike Gravel, what is your big picture view of this two plus years of Mueller investigation, Russia Gate, and the allegations that uh, that Trump was directly conspiring with Vladimir Putin? I, I don't believe that for a moment. We have done more invasion of Russian elections than they've ever dreamed of with us. People lost sight of the fact that when uh, Boris Yeltsin, we not only paid for his campaign, we sent consultants over there to actually physically manage his campaign. Uh, We're American uh, political consultants uh, who have been involved in the presidential campaign in Russia for the last four and a half months. So it was really fun for us and exciting. It was one of the uh, experience of a lifetime for all of us, that's for, for sure. And uh, so we just thought we'd be here and uh, we're happy and pleased and excited to finally be able to tell the story. And um, so we are just be open to your questions. And that was Yeltsin who was then giving all the resources away to these oligarchs and we were all party to that. And so, so when, when we, and of course we, the CIA is always meddled in here, we've meddled in the elections in Venezuela. Well, you, you name it, this is a modus operandi of our intelligence community, is to go ahead and try and screw up somebody's election. Here, th- this is always going to go on. But by talking about it with Russia, we don't talk about what we do, because what we do is considerably more than ever they've dreamed of doing. How would you describe the presidency of of Donald Trump on its own terms? How would you describe his governance, his policies, uh, the impact of his policies and ideas? The impact is, of course, it's made the United States the laughingstock of the world. With respect to his policies, the trade policies are damaging, damaging people unnecessarily. With respect to his stupidity at home the with the immigration issue we're going to build the wall we have no choice we have no choice build that wall 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 wall. what's made our country great and he doesn't have the brain power to understand this What's made our country great is immigration. The whole country was made up of immigrants going back to colonial days. That's what it's all about. 
And so for him to make that his, his major, his major issue to fear these people that are coming in, oh my God, I can't tell you how injurious he is to, to America. Now, the flip side to that is that uh, maybe there's enough frustrations that the people will get off of business as usual, whether it's the Democrats or the crazy Republicans. And maybe they'll realize that the only answer to the, the future of society uh, is, is a governance that involves the participation of the people as lawmakers, the people. That's the solution. I, I want uh, you to tell the story briefly for uh, for people, particularly younger people who may not be familiar with this history, uh, of the action that you took when you read as much as you could into the congressional record of the Pentagon Papers. You had been approached by Daniel Ellsberg, who had tried to get some of the foreign policy luminaries of his time uh, to do this, and they wouldn't. I'm reading summaries of narratives. The narratives are based upon the documents themselves. The congressman, if you'll permit me, I'll continue to read. Explain that story for, for people. When Ellsberg called me on the phone saying, would I read the Pentagon Papers as part of my filibuster against the draft, uh, I said instantly, yes. You did a five-month filibuster, uh, correct, uh, yes. against the draft in Vietnam? Because mm-hmm. what, what was uh, Lyndon Johnson was able to expand the war in Vietnam because of the draft. So it became very clear that if we stopped the draft, and we did, well, uh, then uh, th- then we, we got to negotiate how we're going to get the uh, papers into my possession. Well, uh, little did I know, uh, the one of the editors at the Post was uh, Ben Bagdikian, and he had sequestered a copy that in his own possession. So Dan called him and said, get the papers to Gravel. And so Bagdikian negotiates with me. He wants to transfer the papers to me somewhere in a woods at Rock Creek Park. I said, wait a second, Ben. I've got a little more experience than you have in this. What I suggest we transfer the papers is you take the papers, put them in your car, and at midnight, park your car right in front of the marquee of the Mayflower Hotel with the lights on. And I'll speed up in my car right next to yours, open your trunk, we transfer the papers, and I'll speed off. That's exactly how we did it. Now keep in mind, I was a freshman at this time. I was chairman of the Buildings and Grounds Committee. And so I, we wrote up a, a notice of a hearing, stuffed it, now this is 10 o'clock at night, stuffed it under the doors of the various members of the committee. And then uh, we, we got a congressman from Upper New York to come in and testify. And uh, so I convened the hearing. He said he wanted a federal building. And I said, I, uh, I'd love to give you a federal bill. I know you need one, but unfortunately we don't have the money. And the reason we don't have the money is because we're squandering our treasure in Southeast Asia. Now, let me tell you how we got into Southeast Asia, and I proceeded to read the Pentagon Papers. And then what happened, uh, as I went on for a few hours, uh, essentially I lost control of my emotions. Arms are being servered. Metal is crashing through human bodies because of a public policy. This government. That, that's the vision I had as I lost control. My, my staff, my uh, chief of staff uh, leaned over to me. He couldn't be seen by the cameras because he was kneeling down next to me. He says, see, he says, Senator, you lost it. <laughs> so he said, so he says, he said to me, uh, why don't you put the papers in the record? And immediately I straightened up and, and I, oh yeah, that's the answer. So here I am, I'm the only committee member there and I ask unanimous consent uh, to place all these papers into the record of the subcommittee of the buildings and grounds. And hearing no objections, I slammed the gavel and they're in. Well, Senator Mike Gravel, I want to thank you very much for joining us here on Intercepted. Thank you. Appreciate it. That was former Alaska Senator Mike Gravel. He is a candidate for president running to get the Democratic nomination. You can visit MikeGravel.org to see more of his campaign platform and absorb some of those dank memes from a man who would be 90 years old if he were to win the presidency.